Okay, so, um, so this is an interesting question. This is actually a new question. Um, I don't think uh, we've had this question in past semesters. And there was something I wanted to uh, comment on. And, and you, know, you should review chapter seven, section one and look for what are some of the things that need to be satisfied. So, and I think in plotting it, uh, you can kind of see um, which of these functions don't satisfy the things that need to be satisfied. So it asks, which of the following functions qualifies to be a fun wave function of a particle that can move along uh, the entire real axis? So, and you have to imagine doing this. Um, if you are given some time independent function psi, they are all functional position alone, then you do have to imagine they're uh, tacking on a particular time dependence. Maybe, um, maybe this is an energy eigenstate for a particular um, potential. In that case, if it's an energy eigenstate, then it would have, um, so it would start out as some position and then it'll evolve over time. It'll have a time evolution factor that looks like e to the i e over h bar. Yeah, e over h bar uh, t. This might be minus or plus. <laughs> I don't quite remember. So, um, so, so this is, you should think of this like a snapshot at time equals zero. This is the shape of the wave function. And um, or at some later time, it could change. Um, now, even with that understanding that it's meant to be a snapshot, there are some conditions that uh, real wave functions have to satisfy. And if they don't satisfy that condition, um, uh, it then you know it, it's not a possible wave function. And the biggest of these conditions is um, actually what we end this week with. Uh, which is, uh, um, I guess, what might be called normalizability. So a wave function must be normalizable. And I think the easiest way to say is um, this quantity must be... Um, uh, so if you plot, if you plot wave function absolute value squared as a function of time, then the um, area under the curve must be finite. And if it's finite, you know, not infinite, then you can set the coefficient to A in such a way that you make this uh, the integral. Um, so, you know, when you do the integral, it looks like integral over all space uh, dx. Uh, you can make it come out to one by setting an appropriate value of A. But if somehow uh, with A as undetermined, it turns out to be, if it turns out to be infinite, then there's no possible value of A that would make it work. So that's uh, what I'm gonna be looking for. So um, let me start by just uh, plotting the uh, Psi of X. In most cases, I think a plot of Psi of X will actually give us an idea if it's normalizable or not x and the, my y-axis for now will be psi of x. And you can see almost immediately that some of these functions uh, get uh, ruled out immediately because when I plot this uh, a e to the minus x, now you might think, oh, isn't that an exponential decay? So that, you know, this should decay quickly enough that the area under here is finite but you have to remember what if X goes to negative infinity, this thing blows up as X goes to infinity. So if you are thinking about the, along the entire real axis, this function doesn't work uh, because it doesn't have some condition here that says it goes to zero when X is negative. So, so this won't be one of our choices. It's not a possible wave function for the entire, all the values of X. And, a of tangent of x, um, oh, that's a nasty function. <laughs> when you look at tangent of x, I think it goes to infinity at regular intervals. Because, you know, tangent of x is uh, uh, sine of x over cosine of x. 
So wherever cosine of x is uh, zero, that is where the values of x's are um, uh, pi over two, uh, three pi over two, and add two pi to any of these, um, this goes to infinity. So I, I think this is uh, uh, pathological enough that even without plotting it, I know I cannot make the uh, area under the curve finite. So this is not it. Um, now this is beginning to look promising because when I plot uh, psi of x, so for positive, oh wait, I was doing blue. So the positive value of x, then this absolute value doesn't do anything. It's exponential decay. Now for negative values of x, the absolute value makes it so that, um, so that this is now minus minus x or eight times e to the x. And on the x is negative side, that exponential rise function looks like this. And this is something that I think if we actually did the, you know, did the, um, the size absolute value squared and try to do this integral, then uh, I think it's actually doable. And when you do the integral, you should get that this area that you calculate under the curve is finite. Well, not this area, but when you square it then do all that. So this is one of my choices. Um, and I think for a very similar reason, this will also be the same because here um, instead, so instead of absolute value, I have X squared, but for the purpose of what we're talking about, this uh, uh, square kind of serves the same role as absolute value. When X is negative, this still ensures that this um, decays. And in fact, I think this will end up looking like a normal curve or Gaussian or the bell curve. Um, and I think the hardest one is actually this one. Um, up until um, three minutes ago, I think I was thinking this was not one of the choices, but now I keep going back and forth. I think now I think it is. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. So <laughs> uh, this function has uh, some difficulties. So let me just uh, highlight some of its behaviors. Um, so, so the psi of, um, let me just uh, explicitly write it out. So I'm examining the function uh, sine of x over x. And one of the areas where it could have been troublesome is at the limit where x goes to zero. Uh, this whole thing could have gone to infinity because I have uh, x on the denominator. Now, sine of x, um, but this is the, the sine of x also goes to zero. So this is the place where you might use L'Hopital's rule um, or do whatever. I, I, I'm a physicist. I prefer to just write this out as a Taylor polynomial. And when I do, this looks like x minus x to the third power uh, three factorial plus x to the fifth power uh, five factorial and so on. So the highest order term is this. So uh, here it, and um, so, you know, x over x, that's one. And the rest of the terms will actually go to zero. So, um, so considering this as x goes to zero, this thing should go to one. So meaning at one place where it could have been problematic. It doesn't end up being. Now, so having taken care of that, the other problematic parts are, okay, so what happens as, um, what happens as X goes to infinity? Uh, let's say as X goes to positive infinity. Um, so this is the place where if, if it had been X over X, then it would have been problematic because if it's a constant value of the function, then the area under the integral is not finite when you integrate over the entire real number. But here I have this nice property that um, sine of X, it's a bounded function. It's always gonna be between plus one and minus one and no value of X this will, and no value of real X, it'll be greater than plus one or minus one. So as uh, x goes to infinity, I think this goes to zero. 
because it, it goes as one over x, a large enough value of x. Now, the reason I originally was thinking this is still not an answer was, well, if you do an integral of one over x, dx, um, from, so, so that I make it um, easy for myself, if you do that from zero to infinity, then this actually blows up. This is, a, is it called a harmonic integral? It's one of the uh, in integrals that don't converge. Um, especially as you go to infinity, it, it, you don't, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be starting at zero. Even if this were starting at from one, this would not converge it to a finite value because it goes as a logarithmic and going to infinity as a logarithm is still infinite. But uh, what I was remembering uh, five minutes ago as I was talking about this is uh, I have to square it. So once I square it, then it becomes this. And I think that actually uh, that converges. And um, at, so if this had been just the one over X squared, then I still would have had an issue at, uh, as it goes to zero. But here the sign of X kind of smooths that out. Uh, so I don't have to worry about that as X goes to zero. And as X goes to infinity, the fact that I have to square the function, I think it makes it all okay. So, um, so I think this is one of the answers. Let's test it and see. Yeah, okay, I was worried about that. Um, so there are made, I will tell you, this is not a problem I programmed in. <laughs> I think there may be an error in the question. So I'm pretty sure, yeah, problem considers that to be correct, but um, I'm pretty sure that's an error in the question that needs to be fixed. So let me just do a quick test to make sure um, if uh, if I'm wrong here. Um, so the way to test it conclusively is to use all from alpha. All from alpha is super good at integration. So I'm gonna integrate uh, square of sine of x over x squared from, yeah, I guess this, this, that's the kind of interval that people do. And I think that's gonna be finite. Yeah, that is, I don't know what that is. Oh wait, uh, they give you a numerical value. Yeah, so um, so if you've already been doing this question, uh, you know, as long as you got full credit, that's fine. I'm just gonna reach out to the uh, question writer and have them fix it so that uh, this is actually one of the, uh, uh, it's correct. Um, and I know this comes from a uh, open stack. So, so let me just uh, double check to make sure if there's a second error that I need to file. Um, uh, one error, I know where it has to go. The other error, uh, it depends on if this was one of the questions with a solution and uh, solution at the end. Uh, I want to say it's one of these questions. Which are the, oh, <laughs> let me check. <laughs> Does it say it is not? Okay, um, so there's an error here. I am going to file an error there too, because uh, uh, yeah, this is normalizable. Uh, they forgot that you had to square <laughs> the sign of x. <laughs> this is actually quite typical of textbooks, which is that the solutions are of a lower quality than the textbook itself. The textbooks are written by people with all the credentials, highly qualified individuals with a PhD and you know university professors. Um, the solutions are very often written by graduate students. And I'm not saying graduate students are stupid. I was one once, <laughs> but you know, they don't have as much experience as the people who wrote the textbook. So, so I'll follow through because this was actually a mistake I myself was making even until five minutes ago, <laughs> until I was working through it in detail. 